Lynn, you know I love my coffee. Oh, I love my coffee too. Well, this year I have started a new morning routine to really up my ante, and that is with Trumetta with their mushroom coffee. Mushroom coffee? I know, I know. It does not taste like mushrooms. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, mushroom coffee. It's made by Trumetta. They are a premium supplement company out of California that strives to make self-care easy. So they're putting really wonderful ingredients in your morning coffee that you'll take every day. We've got lime. Lion's Mane Mushroom for productivity, Raishi Mushroom for immune support. Of course, we've got some caffeine in there to give you the kick you need every day. If you feel like you need an uptake in your productivity, and who doesn't, really, you will feel it every time you drink it. And Trumetta offers their best deal to date to fans of Fluster Clucks. You'll get a free electric mixer and 40% off the coffee, plus free shipping in the U.S., So start your day unflustered with Trumetta's Mushroom Coffee, and right now you'll even get a free electric immersion mixer to stir in the coffee creamer of your choice. Fabulous. And 40% off the coffee, plus free shipping in the U.S. So go to trumetta.com slash fluster to fuel your productivity and creativity with some delicious mushroom coffee. T-R-U-M-E-T-A dot com slash fluster. So really being clear with kids that a person has died, it's okay to use that word. It's okay to talk about whatever your family's beliefs are about the afterlife and all that kind of stuff. That's fine. But make sure that as you're using this language, you're not giving kids confusing messages about where this person is now and if they're coming back and how this will be translatable to their little lives. It gets very confusing when we use euphemisms. Welcome to season six of Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and all the big feelings too. We tackle the serious stuff without being too serious. And I'm your co-host, Robin. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author. And I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. I'll give you concrete steps to take and the words to say. Hi, Robin. Hi, Lynn. How's your day going? It's a beautiful spring day, and we're about to take it down a notch. We are, because we're going to talk about grief and loss in kids and how we can help our kids with that. I think it's an important topic to talk about because, A, it's going to happen in all our families. There's no avoiding loss and grief. And also because there are certain ways that grief can really sort of team up with some anxiety patterns. So we just want to pay attention to those two. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about what grief looks like in kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I really want to emphasize, too, as we talk about this, about how normal it is, because there are times when parents worry about their child handling grief and loss. Certainly, anxious kids can get really stuck on the prospect of death. What do we do to help normalize this rather than increase our anxiety or our inability to help our kids through it. We have talked about a family's culture, what they talk about, how they talk about things, how they talk about feelings. And I would think that a family's grief culture, even before there's a significant loss, how does a family talk about death is kind of a thing to think about. Families are their own little culture. And then there are different cultural ways that we deal with death on planet Earth. And so different families deal with it in different ways for sure. And so the goal is with your kids to make sure that particularly as you anticipate a loss, I've had kids in my office. I mean, I had someone in my office whose pet died and they had never, that was the first loss that they had experienced. They hadn't lost a family member. They hadn't lost anybody that was close to them. They love this pet. And the process of sort of understanding how you deal with loss and how you feel that grief was very profound for this little person. And the family needed some help in talking about it and what to say and what not to say. And it certainly depends on how old the child is. So we'll talk about the different developmental phases of it and what to expect and how to react to different things. But different families deal with it in different ways. And you could imagine that I'm going to say the families that don't talk about it at all, the families that don't allow for emotions to happen, the families that just sort of want to deny it and ignore it, that's not going to be the most effective. But 
many families do that for sure. I don't know where I read this or heard this from somebody, but the idea of like one of the healthiest cultures about death is also healthiest culture about life. If you just grew up on a farm and you're surrounded by birth and death of all the animals, it normalizes it. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why it's healthy is that you see the circle of life so much that it doesn't feel like one big freakish thing that you've never encountered before. Right. And the idea or talking to kids about this as part of the cycle of life is really, really hard. Like even adults, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. It's incredibly tricky, I think, for parents to step into this because they're worried that they're going to say the wrong thing. It depends on how they were raised with it. So you're right. The more that we normalize it, again, emotional management, and we could say grief management, is not about denial, suppression, and minimization. It's about allowing it to be there. And then what do we do with it? And how do we help our kids move through it? And what do we have to pay attention with ourselves when we're grieving too? In terms of kids and popular culture, parents are always dead in Disney films. Like that's the joke. I know. Why is that? Why do they do that, do you think? Well, now what I think it is, I think that it's actually for the grownups in the audience who are taking their kids to the movies. Because I think that grief makes us feel very vulnerable and that inner child is always there and present. And I think that it keeps the adult engaged in the narrative at the same way that a child can. So that all of a sudden that 30-year-old parent, that 40-year-old parent is sitting in there observing a Disney story as an inner six-year-old. And it's like creating that kind of connection to the stories. I mean, not to be so cynical that it's like a marketing tool, but I do think that there is something to be said that those stories are very universal about this cycle of life. And they want to dig their claws into you so that that story means something to you. Yeah. Although the thing about the losses in Disney movies is that they're often very much about abandonment, right? It's not like a healthy loss. Like it's not like a saying goodbye. Like I'd love a Disney movie where there's actually sort of a very healthy goodbye versus a mother, mother. I mean, it's just to me, like there's just this abandonment that happens. Like I feel like it's so emotionally manipulative. If we're trying to teach kids about the cycle of life, I think there are so many other ways to do it. I think that they do it in a way that, like you say, maybe it's to hook the parents. Well, and the other thing too, is you talk about sort of the emotional intensity of things. A lot of young adult stuff also has very intense deaths and very intense loss. Two examples that were huge, huge hits were both The Hunger Games and Harry Potter. Right. So a lot of parents were very concerned that their kids were so obsessed with the Hunger Games because, I mean, talk about brutal. What you have to remember is that the Hunger Games is hitting them on a different level that it's hitting us as mothers. So we're putting ourselves into it as mothers. When Jennifer Lawrence says, I'll do it, we're like, oh my God. So they're experiencing it as kids that aren't parents. And there is an attraction to emotional intensity in that age group that makes those stories very compelling. So they are figuring out all of these intense motions. They are thinking about all of this stuff in a way that you don't when you're a little kid, that you do when you're a tween or an adolescent. And that's the attraction, I think, of those really emotionally powerful and absolutely torturous things for parents to think about, but they're attracted to that. That's yeah. true. And actually, yeah, so it's not even Disney. The Harry Potter's central theme is all about loss. And J.K. Rowling lost her mom at a pretty young age. I think she was in her 20s, actually. That I really loved that whole series because of the beauty of a mother's love transcending death. Even the Star Wars films had a lot about loss and sacrifice and stuff too. So these are like really big, I feel like oh, this is the Joseph Campbell Power of the Myth series. <laughs> yeah. Well, truly, I mean, like, why does it come up over and over and over again, right? It's because it is inevitable that we will experience this. Right. And there are so many pop culture conversation points to have to start talking about it in a way that feels a little more natural. So when we come back, I'm ready to hear how we can support these kids. Okay. 
So Robin, when was the last time you really treated yourself like to a pedicure or a massage or, you know, a colonoscopy? If you want to treat yourself to the top options with everything in life, including a colonoscopy, why settle when finding a doctor? Because it's your health after all. So enter ZocDoc. This is the place where you can find and book tens of thousands of top tier doctors, all with verified patient reviews. So I'm not going to settle on my pedicure. I'm certainly not going to settle on my colonoscopy. Go to the best and the right doctor for you with ZocDoc. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. So when you're talking about booking appointments with tens of thousands of top-rated, patient-reviewed, credible doctors and specialists, that makes it easy. The typical wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between 24 to 72 hours, and that's it. You can even score some same-day appointments. And that is such a convenience, isn't it? So ZocDoc is a great way to get the healthcare you need. This is the choice that you should make because it's what we do in order to make sure that we are taking care of our health. So go to ZocDoc.com slash Fluster and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. It's so easy. I've used it for my kids. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Fluster, ZocDoc dot com slash Fluster. Making everyone happy on vacation isn't easy, but you know what is? Going to Aruba. All you have to do is walk out your door to find pristine pools, relaxing white sand beaches, and an island teeming with outdoor activities that'll put a smile on any face. You won't just feel great, you'll all feel great, filled with a calmer, more peaceful vibe that radiates Aruba's warmth. And the best part is, it never fades. That's the Aruba effect. Plan your family trip at aruba.com. If you've got kids at home, I think you probably feel like you're feeding them all the time. It's just trying to come up with good recipes, good food, things they'll eat. Well, There's a great podcast. It's called Didn't I Just Feed You? It's a weekly podcast. It's hosted by longtime food professionals, Stacey Billis and Megan Splawn. And it's about feeding our families. It's even for parents who hate to cook because really, kids eat a lot. So every week, Stacy and Megan get real about feeding kids, tweens, and teens from how to turn nachos into a family dinner. That sounds good. To the magic of meatballs or dealing with that after-school snack problem. They talk about coping with picky eaters and the mental load of being the family cook, all as part of their mission to make cooking easier, more delicious, and maybe even fun. So Didn't I Just Feed You is available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your favorite podcast. You can learn more on didntijustfeedyou.com or find them on Instagram as at didn't I just feed you? You're really going to enjoy listening to Stacy and Megan. They're going to help you out. And isn't that what podcasts are all about? Okay, we're back. Okay, so Robin, let me just give you sort of an overview of kind of what we can expect. And we've sort of touched on it a little bit as we're talking about tweens and teens, but just important to understand that grief is different depending on age and that we bring our developmental stage into the process of grief and loss. Not surprisingly, we bring our family's culture into it. We bring our emotional management into it and our emotional literacy. So if you've got a family where those skills are kind of solid, right? The ability to talk about feelings, the ability to recognize what's going on, the ability to be open and connected during these tough times, that's better than families where it's sort of shut it down. We're not going to talk about it. Isn't it sort of like the litmus test that the families who can and are willing to talk about the hard things like grief are also the families that can talk about other things? And then the families that really have a hard time talking about death probably also have a hard time talking about other things too. So it's like a wake up call. Yeah. Not to always throw my husband's family under the bus, but you know. Here we go. Here we go because there's a bus. When my father-in-law was dying of cancer. If you wanted to watch a family do their thing, 
around to death, it would have been a documentary because all of the stuff that they did as a family, they did as they were facing this death that like, we're not going to talk about it. My father-in-law's whole motto was not, we shall not discuss this in a Victorian household, which I've said before. So we weren't talking about it. There was not conversations with him about what he wanted and that kind of stuff. It was all very shut down. It was all very uncomfortable. My husband would describe it as weird. And I think that didn't surprise me at all. And it was sort of sad. And I've talked about it with my husband and we can make that connection. But then there are other families that I know, families that I've gone through, parent dying of cancer, families that have managed this. And they did it in a, in a way that was very typical of their way of addressing anything, their way of communicating, their way of connecting. So yeah, it just shows up. We had a death in the family and it reminded me of an extended family member's death. And that there's like a group of cousins where the mom and one of her daughters, I would just say lovingly, overly emotive at the funeral, sobbing and screaming to the sky. My mom and I were like, what the heck is going on there? <laughs> you know, like it was, it was really over the top. That was their culture around death. So it was like the total opposite of someone who's like really buttoned up in a Victorian household. And I remember never seeing someone kind of freak out like that before. I was like 10 when I saw it. And I was just like, whoa. So interestingly, that family's culture around loss is just like really, really big tidal wave feelings. So there's a whole range. A whole range. Let me just talk a little bit about sort of what we can expect. So for people who are listening to this and they're like, oh, well, I don't know what to do or I don't know what my kid is supposed to feel or not feel or am I doing the right thing? Or, right, or Let me just give you a little bit of the basics on this. Little kids under the age of probably seven or eight, maybe even a little bit older, they don't really understand the concept of death is sort of not so familiar to them unless they've been traumatized by Disney movies. But this idea that this person is gone forever is something that they have to be informed about. One is that we don't want to use euphemisms when we talk about it. And a lot of times we use language of sort of like, well, he passed on or he's gone to a better place or he closed his eyes and went to sleep forever those euphemisms are really confusing to little kids because they don't understand what we're talking about. And I remember a while ago, I had a family that the grandfather had died and the parents had said to this little five-year-old, well, grandpa has gone to sleep forever. Well, guess what happened? This little kid then suddenly became terrified to go to sleep at night because he had thought that if he closed his eyes and went to sleep, that he was going to be gone too that they were going to put him in a coffin. So really being clear with kids that a person has died, it's okay to use that word. It's okay to talk about whatever your family's beliefs are about the afterlife and all that kind of stuff. Totally fine. I mean, it's just, that's fine. But make sure that as you're using this language, you're not giving kids confusing messages about where this person is now and if they're coming back and how this will be translatable to their little lives. It gets very confusing when we use euphemisms. So we just want to make sure that we're talking about, it's okay to say this person died. And then the second thing is, they're going to ask a lot of questions. And you want to answer those questions directly and clearly. And the thing that parents often do is that they get freaked out or sometimes even weirded out, or even insulted by the questions that little kids ask. Because little kids are very concrete in their thinking. They want to know, like, is he going to have shoes on? Why does he need his glasses? What happened when he died? What does he feel? They're going to ask very direct and sometimes uncomfortable questions. All of those questions are really, really normal, and you just want to answer them with just a few sentences very directly. This is a time when you want to be vanilla ice cream when you're answering these questions and give them the information they need so that they can begin to make sense of this because it's confusing for them. I would just add that if you're suffering from grief when this is also going on and they ask those great questions, but you don't feel like you can be in that vanilla ice cream state of mind, 
because I feel like I was in this exact situation. You just say, those are really great questions. I'm going to find out some answers and I'm going to tell you. Just say that and buy yourself some time so that then the grief wave washes past you and then you can be in that moment. Yeah. And then that said, though, because you bring up a good point, when I say be vanilla ice cream, that does not mean that your kids shouldn't see you grieving. And we want them to see you moving through this, that we want them to be able to witness your sadness and your pain and your loss. But we also want to pay attention to the fact that kids still need you and that you are kind of their guide through this. And so you want to make sure that your emotional management is there, right? It doesn't mean you can't cry. It doesn't mean they can't see you grieving, but you want to make sure that you don't overwhelm them with your big feelings that they don't know how to manage. We don't want to put them in the position of needing to take care of you because that's too overwhelming for little kids to do. And sometimes that happens in families in a lot of different ways. It's called parentification, everybody. So we don't want to do it in those moments which is hard. So you got to buy yourself some time. And you can even, you know, I use the term front loading where we're letting kids know what's happening. You can even say to little kids, you know, there's going to be times when I'm going to be really, really sad. There's going to be times when I'm going to really be crying and that's normal and that's okay. It means that I'm feeling this, like I'm grieving for grandma or I'm grieving for, you know, whoever. It's okay that I'm feeling this way and I'm okay when I'm crying. And that's normal because that gives kids a little bit of a hardwood floor underneath their feet and your feet so they don't feel like they are overwhelmed. Yeah. The other thing, too, that's really helpful for little kids is if they have concrete ways, because they're concrete thinkers, they don't really think in abstraction very often, if they have concrete ways to say goodbye. People ask a lot of questions about, should you take a child to a funeral? Should you not take a child to a funeral? And generally, if a child is old enough to understand from you that this person died, that this person is not coming back, that we're saying goodbye to this person, it really is okay for you to take kids to funerals. There may be circumstances where people decide not to do that based on certain things that happen. But in general, kids can benefit from being a part of that ritual because it's the same reason that we benefit from that ritual, that it is a way of saying goodbye, which is a really important part of human loss. It's really something that we've done for ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's okay to include your kids in that. Pick and choose. There may be not everything you want to include them in, but it's okay for kids to be a part of it for sure. And then rituals of sort of writing a letter or making a little memorial in your backyard, doing things that help kids concretely walk through the process of saying goodbye. Regular listeners know that I lost my mom that I was very, very close to. And I think that the other thing that surprised me is that kids will say and view this very differently than you will and to be prepared for them to say some weird stuff. Or stuff that you didn't expect, and it might throw you a little bit. I mean, it's almost kind of funny. When we told my daughter, who was five at the time, in her like cheery, optimist way, she's like, well, at least I have another grandma. <laughs> right. That's very concrete. Right. That was very concrete. And that was her five-year-old thinking. And she was so in love with my mom. So that was like, it didn't compute in my head when she said it. Oh, you don't know what they're going to say. They're going to process it differently and leave space for that. Right. And that's where you don't want to read meaning into that. And you don't want to take offense to that. Like, does that mean she really didn't love my mother? Or did No, not at all. It's just like, that's how her little five-year-old brain was trying to make sense of it. I remember a family told me that the grandfather died and they had a trip planned to Disney, actually, and they had to cancel the trip. So they sit down and they tell the kids and the kids were like five and seven and nine. And they say, look, Grandpa has died unexpectedly. We're going to have to go to grandma's house, blah, blah, blah. And the seven-year-old was like, does that mean we're not going to Disney? And the mom was so offended that that would be his concern. But that's an absolute reasonable question to ask. And in his world, he couldn't compute that his grandfather had just died unexpectedly. What he knew very concretely is that he was supposed to go to Disney the next day. And so I remember telling the mom, like, that doesn't mean anything about the way he felt. Because she was like, 
does that mean that he's like some selfish sociopath and he's thinking about Disney? Like, no, no, no. He's a seven-year-old. Yeah. And the other thing too is that this goes for adults too, but kids react in ways emotionally that maybe we don't expect. So they ask questions that we don't expect, but also their emotions can be a little bit different than we expect. Lots of times kids might get very energetic, right? So they might start running around the house. There's a lot of silliness that happens. They might get angry. They might have disruptions in their sleep. They might be doing things or saying things or behaving in school in a way that you think like, well, that doesn't really make sense. And this is all of them trying to process something without really sophisticated tools to process it. And so we have to recognize that it's going to show up for them in ways that we don't typically associate with, oh, they're sad or they're grieving or they're upset. They may not want to talk about it. They may not want to be in the house. They may want to be with friends in a way that you might say, gosh, they're really not feeling this or they're really not paying attention to this. It's not true. It waxes and wanes. That's the other thing too. And that's an important thing for adults to recognize too, is that we have to give kids and ourselves a break from grieving. So it is okay. I mean, there's lots of times you're at a funeral and there's laughter and people are talking about things. That is a normal process. It's going to wax and wane for them just as it wax and wanes for adults. And that's also totally normal. Do you think it's appropriate with kids to ask them about their grief if you're not sure if the behavior is related to grief? Or do you feel like you let them tell you or give a hint that it is about grief because they might bring up the person or something? You project your grief onto them. So you're like, tell Mark, how are you feeling about so-and-so? When they were like, well, I was fine till you brought it up again, lady. Right. So you want to give them permission to talk about it. You want to say to them, and again, you could say this in a way in which it just offers them the opportunity, but we don't want to, like you say, project our grief, like they must be feeling this way. So you could say, like maybe you're tucking them into bed at night and you could say, hey, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to understand how much a death impacts us. It's kind of hard to understand all of this. And there's been a lot going on in our house. Are you having any thoughts or questions about it? Is there anything that you want to talk about? And sometimes then they'll be like, yes, I want to know, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes they'll just start to cry. And sometimes they'll say, nope, mm mm-mm. And we have to respect that little boundary they're putting up. And so you offer them opportunities. You know, as I often say, you're like offering the tray of hors d'oeuvres and then you're seeing what they'll take. The other thing to remember about little kids is that they work through a lot of things through play. I have said this over and over again. I'll just say it again. Unstructured play is really an important part of children's development. And so you may see them playing things. You may see them playing a game. You may see them talking about it in a way where they're talking to their animals about it or something like that. And you can even join in that play and kind of let them lead the play because that's a way that they process through things. And they also like to do it through art. They will draw pictures. They have Legos. They might create things. So just you watch that. All of that is healthy and good and normal. This might be advice for older kids, but one thing that I think is like the secret for people who have grieved deeply that you don't know till you grieve deeply is that you don't need to always keep it so serious and that there is laughter and jokes and all those things can coexist. And I think that talking about the funny things that happened at a funeral or the funny things that happen while you're grieving. Like, I think those are really important to talk about so that it's not always so dire. And I think that talking about, oh, the silly thing that a grandparent or parent did and wasn't, I was thinking of this really silly thing today. So even though I can feel sad about something, I can also laugh and like make it a big emotional experience. That's right. And one of the things that's helpful when we're talking to older kids too is to just give them a little bit of information about how things tend to normally progress with grief. So you want them to know that the acuteness that they feel right now, that they won't feel that acuteness forever, that it won't feel as intense, that it won't be a part of every moment of every day. It can be really helpful for kids to know that. 
I talk about all feelings is that our brains are malleable and that we can think about something for a while and then let it go for a while. That information can be really comforting to kids because when they're going through an intense loss, when they're feeling that grief, it feels like it'll never get any better oftentimes. And that's exactly what happens with depression. When we talk about depression, they think I'm going to feel this way forever and we want them to get the message that they're not going to. And a great way to do that is just to begin to insert those other feelings within their grief. Mm -hmm. When we come back, I bet there are other patterns like that kind of global thinking and other things that are sort of a part of the grieving process that we should be looking out for. All right. Hey there, I'm Debbie Reber, the founder of Tilt Parenting and the author of the book, Differently Wired. The mission of Tilt is to change the way neurodivergence, whether that's having a learning disability, having ADHD, being gifted, autistic, or some combination of all of the above, is perceived and experienced so differently wired kids and the parents like us raising them can truly thrive. On the Tilt Parenting Podcast, I get to talk with authors, therapists, educators, and parenting experts who are committed to this mission. I ask the questions my listeners are most curious about when it comes to supporting our kids. And in turn, my guests share strategies for challenges, out-of-the-box ideas for navigating school, best practices for therapies, tips for advocating, and so many thoughtful insights on what it really takes to help our kids grow up feeling seen and respected so they can create awesome lives for themselves. I know that raising a differently wired kid can feel overwhelming and isolating, but I promise you, you are not alone and it can feel so much better. If you're on this parenting journey, come listen to Tilt Parenting. Together, we can shift this paradigm and show up for our exceptional kids with hope, possibility, and joy. No one told us the truth about parenthood. Why? This is the podcast everyone needed before they had kids because now that those little ones are here, whew, there is a lot to unpack. I'm Rachel shepard and I am your host for the podcast, No One Told Us, where we tell the truth about parenting and let you in on all the stuff you really should have known about before having kids. I am the founder of Hey Sleepy Baby, but this podcast is so much more than sleep. We'll be diving into all the topics that you really care about and need to know while you do your best job raising those adorable, tidy humans. Our goal is to just make you feel less alone and less overwhelmed. There are so many things that no one tells us before becoming a parent, and I think that we should really pull back the curtain on becoming a first-time or second-time mom or dad to share the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll have a little education, a little fun, and a whole lot of heart that goes into each and every episode. So join me and our amazing guests each week to hear us talk about what no one told us. Okay, so now back to the show. Okay, so just a few other things to sort of keep in mind in this. There's something about grieving and mourning that you just want to pay attention to in your family, parents, and to make sure that you're giving your kids this message is that we can feel a lot of guilt that we're not doing it the right way. And kids are very good at sort of shaking it up in that way. But one of the things we want to give kids language for is that it's okay to get back to, and I'm making finger quotes, it's okay to get back to normal. Parents will feel guilty that they're sending their kid to the baseball game, or how soon do I have them go back to school? Or adults will even feel guilty that they're doing something normal in their life. And again, we just want to emphasize the waxing and waning of this, that it comes and goes, that it grabs you when you least expect it. I don't like the word closure. I think a lot of grief experts don't like the word closure as if you're supposed to reach this end point. And so we really just want to make a room for the way that it waxes and wanes. And you can model for your kids that it's okay to talk about the person who's no longer there because I think sometimes they feel like they can't bring it up because they're trying to protect you. So you really just want to normalize, normalize, normalize and make room for it. When we talk about kids and adults that are at risk because they already have some patterns in place. You mean anxiety patterns? Anxiety patterns, yeah. So whenever you've got a pattern in place, remember that the anxiety is always looking for something to grab onto. The anxiety is always looking for some content that it can seek its teeth into. And one of the things that I often see 
when I'm working with somebody who's grieving, who also is a ruminator, is that there is a lot of grist for that ruminating mill to go back, to beat yourself up, to say, if only, to talk about like, what if I had done this? What if I had done that? And it is really, really helpful if you notice that in your child and if you notice it in yourself to just call it out for what it is and to say, oh, our worry, our brains are really looking for things to get stuck on. And this is probably going to fit that bill. This is probably going to be one of those things that it's easy for our brains to get stuck on. So we're going to notice when we start talking in that way. We're going to notice when we start ruminating about that. And we're going to have to say to our worry, hey, this is not your territory. I know my grief is going to show up, but I'm not going to let my worry take over and be in charge of the way that I feel about this. Having those direct conversations is really helpful. The other pattern you want to pay attention to, and this is one I talk about all the time because it's so linked to anxiety and depression, is global thinking. So those global responses, right? I'm never going to feel better again. I'm never going to smile. I'm never going to laugh again. Or I was always mean to grandma when she came over. You know, things like that aren't true. That people say things, you, listening to those global words, you want to break it down into parts. I remember watching this clinical demonstration that Michael Yako did actually at a huge convention. The woman who came up on stage, who was his subject for this clinical demonstration, had lost her mom, and she had been her mom's caretaker, and it had been really hard and really draining, and she had had a moment with her mom soon before her mom died that she really regretted. She had spoken harshly to her mom, or she had been impatient with her mom, and so she was talking to Michael about the absolute racking guilt that she felt because this memory had become this global memory of her relationship with her mom. And Michael did a masterful job of helping her see this as a moment in a relationship, not a definition of a relationship. So pay attention to those global thoughts and those global phrases because that is a risk factor. That's a path that we really don't want to go down. So we talk parts. And that's really helpful. And again, just like what I'm talking about grief waxes and wanes, right? There are funny things that happened at funerals. There are sad things that happened at funerals. There are wonderful parts of a relationship that you have with a person. And it doesn't mean that the things that, that annoyed you about the person are gone from your memory because the person died. They were still annoying and you love the person. I always like the image of being stuck in a trench when you're like in a global mindset, you're in a trench and you can't see ahead of you. You just see right now and you're stuck. And I think that verbalizing that, like I'm in a grief trench today, it's actually not that different than being in a depressive trench either. You can't see far ahead of you and you only see this immediate thing and it's all you know. You forgot what was behind you. You can't see what's ahead of you. You're just stuck and it feels like this is always how it will be. And the ability to call it out, have a name for it and to say like, you will get out of your grief trench. Right. This is okay. This is what we experience and we know what it is. And like you say, give it a name. And then one just final point I think that I want to make is this is also the opportunity if you're working with kids or, well, I'm saying that to clinicians, but parents, if you're raising your kids, if you have kids, that if somebody that they know, if somebody close to you experiences a loss, that is a really great opportunity to coach our kids about how to support somebody else's grief say that it's not their own grief, but say their friend loses a parent or something happens and they know the person who's, I don't think we do enough with kids to talk to them about how do you show up for somebody after a loss. And I think that that language, I think is really, really helpful. It's actually something that my mom was really good at with me. And I so appreciate the message of this is what you do and this is what you don't do. And what we don't do is we don't avoid it. We don't not bring it up. If you talk to anybody who's experiencing loss, they say like, look, I'm thinking about it all the time. Our tendency sometimes is like, well, I don't want to bring it up because it might remind them of the person that died. And I always say, no, they, they actually remember that. And being able to give kids permission, even giving them the language, giving them a phrase 
I heard about what happened to your dad or I heard about what happened to your dog and I'm so sorry that happened to you. I feel really sad. Like give them the language. I was listening to this woman talk about after her dad had died, she said, okay, look, if you come to see me during this time, it's going to be hard. It's going to be awkward because right now we're kind of impossible to deal with. That's what she was saying in in her acute grief. And I just thought like, that's so great to say to people. If you come to see me, it's going to be hard and it's going to be awkward. And you're not going to know what to say and I'm not going to know what to say. And we're not trying to fix this, but show up and teach kids how to be present for somebody else in their grief and in their pain. It's just an amazing gift we can give our kids. People do try and avoid. This is for adults too. People do try to avoid because they think, I don't want to bring it up right? So that's like BS. The flip side is if you are like a middle schooler or a high schooler or an adult and you see that person at the office or at school and they're putting some energy into holding it together, you don't go up to them with like really sympathetic eyes and say like, I'm so sorry. When they're trying to keep their game face, So I love that language, but text it to them after work or after school so that they don't have to put a lot of effort into, don't disrupt their ability to keep it together when it's really fresh and new. Right, right. That's great advice too. That's great advice too. One of my friends will say, if she's having a rough time, she'll say, when I see you, please don't ask me how I am. Exactly. Especially say this is happening where the parents are probably grieving more with more rawness than the children. At the school pickup line, don't make that the time and place because they're trying to keep it together for their kids. Yeah. So that's great advice. And I think the overall thing is to acknowledge it and let the person know you know versus this ignoring and pretending it didn't happen. My other friend, I have more than two friends, but my other friend- (laughs) You do. I'm talking about two of my most important friends. She has a great phrase that she uses. I forget where she got it. She says, is there anything that I can do that is in my power to give? Oh, that's so great. That was actually, I think it's so common that one of your good friends, they're grieving and you just say like, what can I do? What can I do? Because that's like the impulse. I want to help you. What can I do? And if you're grieving, you will say, I don't know. There's nothing you could do. So I love that twist on being concrete. And if there is something, truthfully, there's probably not anything you can offer. But if there is, they'll tell you. That's great. Well, and it could be like you say, if there, is there anything that I can offer you that's in my power to give? And they may say, just your empathy or just the fact that you asked that question or just permission to talk about this or whatever. So I just love that. I just love that phrase. And it is, it's messy and it's awkward. I was working with a a little boy whose dad was dying of cancer. It was terminal. We knew that he was going to die. And so after he died, I went to the wake. He saw me from across the room. He sort of raised his eyebrows and acknowledged my presence. And I acknowledged his presence. And then I picked him up a few days later and we went out for ice cream. And I said to him, what have people said to you that's been the most helpful? And he said, hmm, sometimes it was just people letting me talk about my dad. And sometimes it was just letting me play baseball and not talk about my dad. And he said, I think I'm going to put a list together of all the dumb things that people said to me. I hope he did make it. I hope he made that list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was just so cute. I think he appreciated us meeting like we didn't meet in my office. You know, that would have been weird. It just didn't feel right. You know, we needed to go and talk about it over a a Sunday. But he was very pragmatic about it. And he had had time to think about it because he knew his dad was going to die and he had gotten some help and he had been in some support groups. But he was very pragmatic about it. And he was like, yes, people say dumb things and people say helpful things. But I think people need to know what the dumb things were. And I was like, I think that's a good project. Yeah. I don't know if he did it. He never showed it to me if he did. Yeah. It was so cute. Okay, so let me just end with some resources that will be helpful to you as you're trying to navigate this. One of my favorite grief people is David Kessler, K-E-S-S-L-E-R. He's got a lot of great resources. He's been around for a long time. He has his own very interesting journey of loss. So he comes at it from a very genuine and empathic place. And there's another resource I'd just like to point out because it really is pretty amazing. 
somebody I know quite well actually started a resource specifically for siblings that have experienced loss. And it's an underserved group. And this resource is called Friends of Anya. And you spell Anya A-I-N-E. These are parents who started this organization. It is in New Hampshire, but if you go on their website, there's a lot of great resources. If you're local, they have support groups, they have events, they are doing amazing work at talking about grief. So if you're looking for language, if you're looking for ways to deal with this with your kids, I would check them out. Super, super helpful, incredible. They experienced their own loss of their own daughter. And it is amazing what they have done to help other people. There's also that wonderful summer camp for kids who've lost their parents to cancer. And they all say it's the greatest thing because they get to be around other kids who don't say the stupid things because they've been there. Yeah. And that boy I was just talking about, he did go to that camp and he went when his dad was dying. And then he also went after his dad died. Like if I see him and I say, what's the best part ever of your life? I mean, really, he would say, the time I spent at that camp. Mm, that's powerful. It's powerful. It was so helpful for him to be given permission to talk about this with other people who were experiencing the same thing and who weren't afraid to talk about it. So yeah, there's resources out there, but those are just a few of them. Thanks for listening. And if you found this podcast helpful, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this information. And if you'd like to dig deeper on any of these topics, we have specialized playlists on our Spotify profile and the link is in the show notes. Topics like teens, depression, and OCD. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Robin. I'm Margaret. And I'm Amy. And together we host the podcast, What Fresh Hell?, laughing in the face of motherhood. Margaret, I would say you're sort of a where are my keys kind of mom. Correct. Sometimes a where are my kids kind of mom. <laughs> well, you're Amy more of a we were supposed to leave 35 seconds ago, mom. I mean, touche. In each episode of What Fresh Hell, we come at a topic from our usually completely opposite perspectives. I bring the research. And I bring kind of the gimlet eye. Like, is that research really going to work, people? And almost 10 million downloads later, we're still laughing. We also talk to experts in the parenting field, plus parents with stories we can all learn from. We make each other laugh, we challenge each other's assumptions, and we have what we think is the best parenting community on the internet. Check out What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood wherever you listen to podcasts.